Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to yet another Clockwork Empires video by me. My name is Alfred. I make these about once a month when there's a major update to the stable branch, which in this case was last Thursday. Now, uh, you can probably see if your resolution is high enough up in the top right corner here. It says version 41B. It's because 41 was released on Thursday, and then there were two hotfixes pa uh, patched in like over the weekend. Uh, yes, the devs were busy uh, fixing problems over the weekend, so good for them. And maybe they should take a break now. So, um, one thing I should mention, although this is episode one, I actually made an episode zero on Friday. Uh, that was because I wanted to get something out, but I was also going away for the weekend. So, there's some stuff I covered in that one that I'm not going to go over again on this one. But I'll refer to it, and if it sounds interesting, uh, you should maybe check it out in episode zero. So, let's fire up a new game. Now you'll notice one of the new buttons here is Create New World. And uh, again, I'll ask you to refer to episode zero for what exactly that does. But this is new. Uh, in brief, you see this fancy new map in the background with the you know, I, little bitty islands in the turquoise ocean? That's a fancy new procedurally generated world map. And that's what the Create New World button does. It regenerates this map every time you click that button. Uh, now right now that doesn't do anything, but eventually you're supposed to be able to pick your starting location on that bi on pick your starting location and thus your starting biome on the procedurally generated map. So when it's fully implemented, I suspect like selecting a starting colony location up here in this desert looking island will start you in a desert biome and picking a location here in the water surrounded by this dark green foliage will be a jungle biome. And uh, you can see where the big green arrow is. That's probably a mixture, right? It's like a, the temperate biome. As of right now, uh, the only two starting locations are still the, the same ones we've always had, the temperate and the jungle biomes. Um, I, I assume they're working on that. The other new thing, which again, I covered in more detail in episode zero, is the new loadout button. So it used to be that when you started a colony, you would get uh, just this basic my, fir uh, my First Colony starter pack. It's got like a mix of overseers and, you know, a reasonable amount of food and materials and stuff. Now there's all kinds of variants on these buttons. Now, for, for a more in-depth look at what they do, again, episode zero. Basically there's like super hard mode, start with no supplies at all. Metal Workers Trove, you start with everything you need to start, uh, start like a blacksmith, but no food. Uh, or tons of food and no materials. It's stuff like that. Uh, fun stuff. Let's, uh, which one will I pick? Uh, let's go with the Advanced Colony Starter Pack. So, essentially the same as the default starting pack, but slightly more advanced materials and slightly less of them. I'm going to start a new one in the, let's say, let's just go for the ton, uh, Tempered Biome for now. So, um, a bunch of new stuff in this episode in this uh this episode in this revision first of all I, I, as always there are always a bunch of balancing things and uh bug fixes which is kind of invisible unless you've been actively playing the game and making note of them like area all sorts of little things are getting better uh the, the two hot fixes that went over the weekend fixed like soldier misbehaviors uh there have been a bunch of behind the scenes balancing passes uh, the devs were working on... Wow, that was loud. The devs were working on adjusting the rate at which you get new overseers, and that is now tied to your productivity. So it used to be that like every three days, you'd have the opportunity for a favor from the Empire. So let's just start things off with the carpentry here. You'd have the opportunity for a favor from the Empire. Uh, which means you, you know, based on the amount of prestige you had earned, you would get uh, difficult to talk and click. Based on the amount of pres uh, prestige you had earned and thus had available to spend, you could purchase immigrants or additional overseers to supervise your work crews, that sort of thing. However, uh, that is no longer the case. There is still a favor menu, so you can still purchase things with the favor you accumulate. However, uh, what happens now is that 
the rate, specifically the rate at which you are offered an overseer is uh, gated by the, the speed at which uh, you produce goods and their quantity. And the choice is either a work overseer or an NCO, so a military overseer. And you have to pick at that time. Anyway, the rate at which that happens is constantly being adjusted and like the devs are like analyzing uh, the, the generated console files and stuff like that. All very cool stuff. But it does represent a change from what we're uh, change from what we're used to. So uh, I've got the colony underway to get anything that. So you'll notice I have some, some iron ingots, a little bit of stone, but no planks. Definitely gonna need some stone. Let's get you quarried and uh, let's chop down these trees for now. Some quick timber. So there's a dodo wandering around in here. So I'm going to set my military overseer to, he's allowed to hunt. There we go. Dodos will never, uh, dodos will always be a reliable source of food. I'm sure it'll always be that way. So this is our starting colony. Uh, there have been a bunch of UI overhauls as well. It's kind of hard to see, but if you look at, uh, for one thing, the text is smaller. I think they fix a lot of text wrapping problems. And if we look at like the scroll bar on the right of this work crew menu, first of all, it's a different color than the background, which it, it which is new and nice. And also the icons are a little bit tidier. Uh, yeah, so all in all, just little tweaks here and there. Uh, a lot of the times there, there were font problems as well. I think they've got most of those, plus like spelling errors and stuff. Uh, whoops, I was paused. One of the cool new things that was introduced in 41, actually introduced in a, an experimental uh, patch prior to 41, but then fully implemented in the stable branch, is the system of colonist desires. So we'll look at Augustus Bronzelock here. In addition to the usual traits and afflictions, and these are his recent memories, uh, there are two new lines here, desires and property. Yes, it's possible for colonists to own property, even though uh, that doesn't actually affect the game in any way right now. And the ultimate aim, as the devs mentioned, I think, was that people will eventually be able to claim their own beds and claim specific objects. Uh, I suspect this will result in colonists wanting to own the mysterious artifacts and fishy idols and things that you dig up, which is probably bad news. And uh, but also that's property, but there are also desires. Augustus Bronzelock. Uh, his one desire is to kill another human being. That's always um, that's a worrying trait in my only soldier. And he also wants a bed. Let's look at uh, Pathina Robin Cotter here. If I can click on... Okay. Let's look at Redigor Tar instead. He also wants to kill another human being. And wants a bed. Surely... Surely I do not have a colony of uh, murder. Okay, here we go. Pathina Ironwick. One of her desires is to see a fish person. Um, yeah, I'm not finding a lot of healthy desires here, but that's okay. Ah, here we go. Gilbert Steampoint. Wait a second. He wants to... His desire is to join a cult. Well, anyway. Th that's a little bit worrying. Nonetheless... Uh, now our colonists are a little bit more fully rounded. Uh, they have their own desires and things they will they will prefer to do, given the opportunity. Just a little bit more, uh, making the a little more meat on the simulation bone. So we're just gonna keep on. Actually, I'm gonna wait until this carpentry is built to build the kitchen. So other new stuff. Um, a bunch of stuff was optimized. The game runs a little bit smoother than it used to and hopefully it's a little bit less crashy. Uh, a funny note in the uh, patch notes was actually a note that says fixed. Save game won't crash if you have more than 8,000 jobs. Brackets, you should probably not have as many jobs. Close bracket, right? Like this whole, I don't like to have more than 10 jobs pending. So 8,000 is way too much. Uh, I assume that invokes some kind of overflow error or something. 
Let's see how the carpentry is doing. Got enough stone in there, got enough planks. Getting some planks in the storehouse. We are actively quarrying some stone, okay. We'll be ready for a kitchen soon. Uh, there's some other little stuff, like characters, uh, the way characters forget is now properly affected by the, the way in which they drink. So it was kind of always the way that characters with bad memories could benefit from alcohol but it didn't consistently erase the bad memories. So it's a little bit, ironically, alcohol is a little bit more reliable now. Uh, another thing I did mention in episode zero, but I haven't had the opportunity to actually demonstrate, is that prestige favors are now, a lot of them are only temporary. Uh, for example, it used to be you could, when you had, you had the opportunity to spend a prestige favor, you could spend five and get a squad of five red coats. That same option still exists. However, uh, now they only stick around for three days. Uh, that's deliberate. It's so you can't just add pop, add to your population willy nilly. You, I guess, you value your uh, your population grows a lot more slowly, and it's more important. Uh, you can't just rely on population favors to shore up your stupidly high death rate. Uh, a, a new type of favor as well, the prisoner work crew exists in the favor menu. You can get a bunch of worker, uh, you can get a bunch of prisoners in to do the menial tasks around your camp or your colony. Again, they only stick around for three days. They actually have a new model. There are the prisoners in the stripy white and black prisoner jumpsuit, and they're actually overseen by an overseer. Uh, other little stuff. Romantically inclined people will occasionally cry over graves. So some people, in their traits, they are... Uh, this guy is a beetle fancier. Okay. I, well, I'm not going to be able to find someone. Uh, nope. Anyway. Up in the traits, you'll see it'll be the a heart symbol. And that indicates that uh, a particular colonist is romantically inclined, which means they make relationships. Uh, much more easily and they can fall in love uh, those types of people are also uh, now able to cry over graves so once i have a corpse to bury uh, they can wander over and uh, cry at the gravestone if it's someone uh, presumably if it's someone they knew typically the only people i bury in my graveyards are bandits and uh, like filthy foreigners uh, which ones are filthy? Uh, which ones are filthiest is always as always determined randomly. Right, we have the Republic Mechanique, the sort of French, the Stalmarkians who are sort of Prussian, and the Novorus who are sort of Russian. Uh, but whether they are hostile, neutral, or allied is actually determined randomly every time you start up a new game. So uh, the filthiest of foreigners is. We don't know who, which one that is yet. Man, this uh, this carpentry is going slow. Uh, there are a bunch of little like animation fixes. Like people would walk up to a bed and quote. I'm making air quotes here. You can't see it. Uh, sleep unquote. But the animation wasn't hooked up properly. So sometimes they would just continue standing by the bed while the game thought they were sleeping. And this led to a lot of people thinking, what's going on with my colonists? They're just standing there being lazy and idle, when in fact, they were sleeping. So that's been fixed. Or it's supposed to have been fixed, so now they will actually sleep in cots. Um, here's a funny patch note. Colonists intending to hug fish people will no longer hug normal people, just fish people. Uh, there were some little fixes regarding starvation. Oh, naturalists. The way naturalists work has been overhauled. So we can see here, I've got a clump of malachite and I've got a, I've got a flag that indicates this zone requires a mineralogy report. Now, oh, auto save firing off. Now what this means, uh, so the prevalence of surface nodes has been drastically reduced. Uh, we've only explored just a tiny little bit of this map, so it's probably not immediately apparent, but it's going to be a lot harder to find nodes visually. Like this clump of uh, malachite ore will, in some cases, will not be visible and all we'll get is this little gold carrot. 
And that's because uh, the function of the naturalist has now been fixed. So the naturalist's job is to wander over to these things and generate an actual report. Once he's generated a report, this gets a permanent flag over it that says, if you build a mine here, you'll generate copper ore, or well, malachite ore, which is re refined into copper at this location. Often in other unexplored areas, uh, all we get is the little gold flag. And we don't know what it generates because there's no surface ore, it's all hidden underneath. So that's the function of the naturals. It's, uh, they actually do something useful now. And there's a new build. I'm still waiting on these carpentry workbenches. So there's a new building that can be built. The naturalist office, which I clearly do not have the resources to build because it's on par with like the laboratory. Eat freaking like glass and brass cogs and things. Uh, I'm not gonna try building that yet. But the, the point of the naturalist office is that you can create naturalists and naturalist reports in it. It will facilitate the function of the naturalist. So uh, maybe I'll get around to that in the course of this playthrough. You can also get naturalists again on a three-day loan as a favor from the Empire. Again, they're temporary and not permanent like they used to be. Um, there's a bunch of new events, which hopefully will... Come on, why isn't anyone... Oh, okay. Redigor Tar is busy building the doors before he builds the the modules. Um, so, a bunch of new events. As always, more and more events get added in every time. There's now a major bandit raid event. And uh, you know how you'll get notifications periodically that, you know, a new bandit camp has set up over here, and this is its name. And another camp of four bandits has set up over here. But they, it used to be that they would only attack, like, one at a time. One camp at a time. So you get four guys attacking, or two guys attacking, or if it was a bad day, six guys attacking. Now you can randomly also get the major bandit raid event, in which all the bandit camps attack you at once. You'll have plenty of warning, of course, but hopefully you have enough soldiers to fend them off because now you're going to get bandit raids like 16 bandits are attacking. And you have the same options as you did with the old raids. That is to say, tell all your soldiers to fight them off or give them what they want, like let them steal stuff and uh, hopefully they won't slaughter everyone in town. There are a couple of new... Uh, possibilities for fishman interactions uh, again you, the initial option is always you know ignore them shoot them on sight uh, try and make friends with them that sort of thing and then it, it's a branching decision tree right what was available uh, later depends on what you chose previously now fishman behaviors have always also been fleshed out a bit fishmen might become angry if they find another fishman corpse which is kind of how it used to work, but kind of not. Basically, fishmen now communicate with each other. They'll raise the alarms, because one of your interaction options is to shoo the fishmen away or hassle them until they stop like, stomping on your precious wheat crop. That will now make fishmen unhappy, and they will try, uh, they will communicate with each other. That will affect the disposition of future incoming fishman groups. Really? Rydgar Tar has decided to save the the most vital part of the carpentry for last. He's even building that cot. Okay. Whatever. He'll, he's going to do it next. Uh, yeah. Uh, other little things in the jungle biome. There are... You know what? I'm going to start that kitchen now. Waited long enough. The jungle biome is the biome with uh, palm trees and coconut palms. And uh, one new thing is that coconut palms, it used to be you could just chop them down, but that wouldn't do anything. And uh, then you no longer have a source of coconuts. Coconut palms now generate timber or what it was in real life. It's called uh, like coconut wood or whatever, but yes. So coconut palms now generate lumber for you when you chop them down. And a, a little thing, but, you know, it makes sense, right? Um, there have been little optimizations to the stockpile. Uh, 
the way in which stacking happens has been improved a little bit. Uh, there's a new event, the Ravenous Herd event. And oh, my favorite, as I mentioned in episode zero, the Beetle, the Beetle Havoc, oh, I call it the Beetle Havoc event, uh, in which several giant beetles and a bunch of the medium-sized beetles all rush your crops. They're trying to eat your wheat and cabbage and stuff. And um, if you don't have the main power on hand, you're going to lose your entire crop. And if you let the giant beetles plow through your fields, they'll destroy anything that comes in their way. I don't think they actively, uh, I don't think they aggressively attack your colonists, but they'll destroy your food supply, just like real world beetles. Uh, now on the plus side, if you are able to kill them, they drop a ton of beetle meat, which might uh, mitigate your uh, chances for starvation because you just lost your precious wheat crop, for instance. So, oh, here we go. Here's the new immigration interface. Now it used to be the, the option was to get three immigrants or get spend some prestige and get zero immigrants. Uh, now it's uh, the option is to receive two immigrants or receive no immigrants at the cost of two prestige. And if I had more prestige, then I would also see the option to receive more immigrants than usual at the cost of uh, four prestige, I believe. It costs more prestige, basically, to get more or less than two. Uh, suspicious goods. I have the option to accept some goods. Yeah, I think we could use that. So some of the stuff fell off the back of a Zeppelin. Don't ask questions. Here's our new stuff. I should probably have set up an airship mast so the crate didn't drop in the middle of town. So we got a little bit of sphalerite and a little malachite, which is disappointing because I can't use those until I build a metalworks. I do, however, have five brick. Huh, that's nice. I'm going to build that airship tower now so this doesn't happen again. Over here is fine. Yeah, uh, so a bunch of new stuff. And I realized <laughs> I didn't get a lot of, we did not see a lot of progress in the colony in this episode. Yeah, but as we continue playing, I'm pretty sure the new stuff will become apparent. The new interactions, the new events, uh, refinements, all that sort of stuff. And I've, I think I've covered most of the new stuff. So I'm going to wrap this episode up here. Uh, keep it nice and or keep it a reasonable length of time. I think I've covered, by and large, most of the new stuff between episode zero and episode one. And then from this episode forward, for the next couple of episodes, I'm just going to concentrate on building up the colony. So uh, it's been a little taste of Clockwork Empires. It's a game in early access available on Steam and through uh, the developer's page, and I believe also in the Humble Store, the developers are Gaslamp Games. Uh, my name is Alfred. I do this about once a month when a big major push hits the stable branch. Well, thanks very much for watching, and have a good one.